Welcome back to another episode of the Brett Snodgrass Podcast, and I'm with my good friend Jaron Barnes in the Hizzy House today. Hey, Jaron. What's up, man? What's going on? Well, man, I'm uh, not much. I'm just sitting here having a conversation with you. I'm really excited to be on your show, man. I really appreciate the invite. It's a big honor. No problem, man. I We just got done reminiscing, guys. If you guys don't know Jaron Barnes, go check out uh, some of our earlier stuff that we did. Actually, Jaron helped me launch the Simple Wholesaling Podcast four plus four to five years ago. Uh, he was on the first 96 or so episodes of the Simple Wholesaling Podcast. We had a lot of fun. Man, has it really up. been four or five years? I feel I old, I man. I know. I've always been the youngest one in the crowd and not anymore. I'm like, now I'm going to be 30. I'm going to be 30, man. I'm going to be as old as you. <laughs> no, I, you can never catch me. Isn't that crazy? Like, you know, people say like, oh, I'm going to be old. You never can catch because we nope. all go at the same pace. Yep, that's right? true. And that's like, it blows my mind. Anyways, uh, thanks for being on the show, man. Hey, if you guys are tuning into this, go check out our YouTube channel, the Brett Snodgrass YouTube channel, or check out the Brett Snodgrass podcast on any of the podcast channels that you guys listen to your podcast on. And uh, please subscribe, comment, and uh, I'll get back with you when I read those comments. So, like I said, man, uh, it's awesome to have Jaron Barnes on the podcast. Jaron and I go way back. He helped really build, honestly, the simple wholesaling brand and the simple wholesaling business uh, from around 2015, 16. Uh, worked with alongside you for two or three years, man, and uh, and your wife, Asia. And, and it was just awesome. He helped to really scale the business, going from about 10 deals a month up to we were doing 25, 30 deals a month. Crazy stuff, right? And, and now he actually works with RE Tipster, uh, which is a blogging website. They also come out with real estate courses, and they teach a lot about uh, just real estate investing in general. Uh, so check out retipster.com. And he has a full-time land business in Florida as well. So, yep. man, it's good to have you on the show. And uh, I just want um, to hear, again, just kind of your story, man, because... I know we we chat a lot about a lot of our listeners. This might be the first time hearing you and and just kind of hearing who Jaron Barnes is. So why don't you just kind of step us back? I know you don't have too many years under your belt, but you're only about thirty. But take us into yeah, your story. Man. Well, what what uh, where do you want me to begin? Like, do you want me to go um, I when a man begin... loves a woman and my parents met? And <laughs> I, want you, I really want you to begin when you used to paint your face like a clown. Start. Yeah, there. yeah. So. Um, when I was a teenager, so I, I guess giving some context, my my parents divorced when I was like, I think like one and a half or something. So I just always rec like my entire memory is my parents being split up. Um, and um, when I was living with my mom in California and in my teenage years, um, I got into like drugs and stuff pretty early. I started using drugs every day at the age of 13. So I was like 13, 14. Uh, I stopped when I was 15, uh, yeah, 15. Um, and that, I did some stuff before that too. Like I, I think the first time I like drank alcohol or whatever, I was like six or seven with my sister and just kind of grew up more in a party scene. Um, but it was weird because we weren't like poor or like ghetto. Like we, we were like, uh, my mom was very much upper middle class. So, um, you know, looking back, it was really funny. Um, I, I, when I was in this phase of, you know, the insane clown posse and wearing my face uh, like a wicked clown and going outside in public that way, I would, uh, <laughs> I would like glorify poverty and I'd be like, yeah, man, the, the streets of Fremont, California, blah, 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 or like Pescadero where there's like two people in a stoplight in the entire town, you know, whoa, whoa. like I, I was, it's so weird. Like I thought I was you know, hardcore and had really struggled in life when I was like just a spoiled little kid. You know? <laughs> You're like suburbia. <laughs> yeah, total suburbia, like <laughs> hardcore, man, you know, <laughs> and that. Uh, but I mean, like pain is pain, right? I definitely did carry like a lot of stuff in my head and heart that was not good. Um, and I was a troubled child, to say the least. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was I was a pretty radical dude on a fast track to to nowhere. I mean, I, I literally had the inspiration in life to like become homeless. Like I, I thought to myself when I was, you know, freshman in high school, what's the point of getting a job and being an active member of society because you have stress and bills and all these problems. Whereas if you just become a nomad and you just go to like 
festivals all the time and do whatever the heck you want. That's truly the life of Akuna Matata. And I actually like used to, my mom would drop me off in Santa Cruz, California, and I'd go hang out with a bunch of homeless people. And I had like a, a street dad named Junior who told me, as long as you graduate high school, I'll come out and you can come out and live with me and I'll show you the ropes of how to be homeless and survive and all that. So like my, I was really like planning on just like being uh, nobody really and having no real intrinsic value in, with my life. Um, was there and from, was, yeah. did, where did that kind of come from? I mean, was it just something that you wanted to be different than, than the people surrounding you? Uh, you know, did you, I, th- I think a lot of it was, I just didn't really fit in, in life. Um, I have a lot of different influences and a lot of different cultural influences, um, in my life. And, um, like for example, my dad, when I was in fourth grade, moved to Georgia. Um, and Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, is very different than California. My mom was adopted by a Portuguese woman, so I'm not Portuguese, but my grandma, I used to call my grandma Volvo, and like she used to have Portuguese stuff going on um, in the background. My dad married a Puerto Rican woman, and in Georgia, I, I had. Um, at one point, nine people living in the house and me and my dad were the only white people. Um, and growing up, her parents lived with us and they didn't speak English. So, you know, like all of those things had a big influence and there was a lot of other influences too, but those, that's just kind of scratching the surface. And I, I think what has happened is there's this whole concept called third cultured kids where it's a term used to describe missionary kids where like, let's say you're, American, but you grow up in China on the mission field or in, you know, some African nation or um, what have you, or vice versa, you're South Korean, but you grow up on the mission field in some other country that's different than your ethnicity, right? Well, they kind of are in between cultures, like they belong everywhere and they belong nowhere, like to their own, they don't really fit in. Um, And I think because of a lot of the influences and moving around, like another major huge culture shock was I was born in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, But then my mom moved to a really small town between Half Moon Bay and Santa Cruz, um, where there was 48 kids in my graduating class. So not just like my immediate class, but 48 kids in the entire like you know, 2009 graduation class. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was very rural and a lot of Hispanic influence. There are a lot of people that came over the border and didn't speak English. And so there was just a lot of different exposure to a bunch of different stuff. And I think a big portion of what, um, led me to being kind of like, um, almost like in response to not fitting in, like owning being an outcast and trying to like be, a um, there's a word, I forget what it's called, but like um, somebody who like wants to be on the fringes of society um, that, you know, that I, I think it, a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was a third cultured kid and I just didn't really fit in anywhere. Um, but I, probably second to that, another thing, I think a lot of my problems growing up honestly stemmed from being from a divorced family. Um you know, I do think that divorce is sometimes the the better of two evils. Like I, I'm I am very thankful that my parents got divorced when they did and that I did not grow up in a household where they tried to force it to make it work because they absolutely can't stand each other and they're not compatible. And um, it would have been way more destructive and way more uh, of a nightmare growing up than than um than them getting a divorce. But it, there's still negatives that come from it and there there's no way around it. Like yeah. there, it's just going to happen. And I think that, um, you know, there was always this overhanging, like when you do something wrong, one of your parents would be like, if you don't change your behaviors, you're going to go live with your dad, you know, or mm-hmm. you're going to go live with your mom. And so there, I think that subconsciously there was always this like uh, not feeling secure or feeling like I belonged somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Jordan Peterson, actually, a guy I really like to, to listen to, he talks about how um, it's important that you teach your kids to become somebody that's likable in society, because if they start off and they're not likable, there's a, a compound effect that essentially happens where 
they're not likable, then they get rejected by peers and other teachers because they're difficult. And then they feel more rejected and then they double down on their bad behavior. And then there's just like this negative cycle where they become um, perpetually uh, not somebody that kind of a lone wolf and, and outside the social construct of society. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that, that there was just a lot of that going on. And, um, you know, my sister had a big influence on, on me in terms of like drugs and, and crazy stuff too. Like she was a pretty negative influence looking hindsight. Um, she would, she was addicted to crank and would like, my mom worked nights and she would watch me and we would like, she would quote unquote sneak out of the house. I didn't know we were sneaking out of the house and she would take me and go wherever the drugs were and, you know, all over town. And, and so I just grew up with a lot of crazy, weird stuff that I had to sort through. And I, yeah. so I think it all kind of the, the whole insane clown posse thing is a, um, a music group that is a little bit more than a music group. It's almost, I wouldn't put it into like a religious category or a cult category. I wouldn't go that far, but it's more like that than just a normal band. It's not like listening to Lincoln park and being a fan. Yeah. There is, there's philosophy and there's, um, culture you know yeah. and and i was a uh, a juggalo uh, which is what they call their follow followers because they essentially said we are the outcasts we are the people who are rejected and i resonated with that like yeah. i don't fit in anywhere blah 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 so i'm gonna sing about cutting off camel heads and putting them on and go to school and be a weirdo you know wow so that's that's we'll what i was to- uh, all into We'll, ha- we'll definitely have to put a picture up because I do have a picture of Jaron uh, with his insane clown posse face in uh, his shirt. But but man, I think a lot of our listeners can obviously relate to being an outcast, possibly, maybe not to the extent of what you felt, but, but not really fitting in. And uh, so was there a time that just kind of shifted? Uh, because obviously, I mean, I've only known you for six maybe uh, what six seven years now and I've, I've always known you're a you're a great guy man of faith a uh, good husband now a good father and we've went through that journey i've seen you go through that journey together and that's the way i know you was there a time that it just shifted for you oh yeah so like what stopped all the crazy stuff was when i was 15 august 25th 2006 i had a really radical encounter with god like um <laughs> You know, it's funny. I was just about a month ago or two months ago, my pastor was over um, because he's actually like, it's weird. I have like a real legit pastor who actually like disciples me and pastors me and is like involved in my life. And I don't know how that happened. And I don't think that it's very scalable because if you had like a church body that was larger than like 150, like Mm -hmm. I think that would start getting really hard Mm -hmm. because it just uh, anyway. He was over at my house though. And um, he's really involved in my life. He's kind of like an uncle or, or, you know, father kind of figure in my life or what have you. And um, we were talking about my conversion story because they haven't heard the full thing. And, um, and it's really striking with who I am today and how I function today with who I used to be before I became a Christian. And, um, and so it's really hard for people to wrap their head around but August 25th, 2006, um, I was, I literally cussed out a girl in school and it was, um, given in school suspension. So on Monday, um, this, there was a youth lock-in on a Saturday and on Friday I had gotten in school suspension. So I was going back on Monday to go into suspension. Um, and I was singing about smoking weed and, and all that. And then Monday morning, I came back talking about Jesus. And wow. I mean, it was like very radical. Like everybody that I went to high school with, uh, a lot of my teachers, everybody was impacted because they saw this very aggressive kid, <laughs> uh, it, uh, I guess, towards the things of of darkness, you know, like yeah. radically turn around and I mean, I was, I still had a bit of a rebellious streak in me. I had a process, you know, like I was so, um, prioritizing the gospel and, and the Bible and stuff. Like I remember in, um, in, uh, science class, my teacher saw me reading the Bible instead of paying attention. And she's like, why, why, uh, why won't you just put your book down and pay attention? Or can you please put your book down and pay attention? And I said, well, no, I can't. Cause th- what I'm reading is more important than what you're teaching. And like, <laughs> and she didn't know what to say because she was a Christian. Right. So, and it was funny. She ended up like buying me a bunch of like Bibles and a bunch of other stuff. But um, so yeah, man, I was, I got really radical really quick because I just had this 
really, really powerful experience. It's probably, I mean, it's kind of lengthy, but if you want to, we can dive deep into it. Well, I think I know we've, we've, uh, there was some earlier episodes, obviously on the simple wholesaling podcast. And if you guys check back and, uh, we can definitely, uh, put a link in our description here of yeah. Jaron's testimony, very, very powerful testimony. I know I've heard it and, uh, Jesus re really radically changed your life. And I want to definitely get into kind of what you're doing now too, and your family, but, um, do you, I have one question though. Do you think, obviously you were studying the life of Christ and the disciples. And do you think that obviously you did kind of relate to their life, to kind of the outcast? Uh, I mean, they were rebellious a little bit, obviously, and during that time. Um, yeah, I think so. I, for, for whatever reason, you know, now you're getting older or I'm getting older. So now I, I see the, the foolishness of my youthful ways sometimes, but for whatever reason, I just, I glorified rebellion. Like I just thought like anything that was opposite of what everybody else was doing was like the way to go. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, to be honest, there's, you know, the conventional group thinking is very dangerous, but um, there is also a negative side to rebellion just for rebellion's sake. But I do remember when I first started reading the Bible and really getting into this stuff, um, I did have an epiphany where it was just like, <gasps> It, the most rebellious thing I can do in life is be obedient to God because nobody, nobody mm. wants to be honoring to God. Yeah. So if I want to go against the status quo, I should just be super obedient to God. <laughs> that is true. So I was just like, Oh, I want to be the rebellion uh, re uh, rebel of the rebellion or the rebel of the rebels. You know, <laughs> that is true, so, man. That is yeah, true. I definitely re related to that early on. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, let's fast forward a little bit, man. So you're, you're an outcast. You came to Christ. Um, fast forward. I know you had some miraculous things kind of happening. You did some mission work and living in a homeless shelter and, and things like that's how you met your wife, Asiya. Um, let's just kind of talk about getting into the real estate. You worked for Bigger Pockets for a little bit, heard about real estate. And then I want to, I want to talk about just the kind of how we got together and, and you really, Obviously, I, I always said this before, back when we were on the same team, is you really helped put our company on the map, the Simple Wholesaling Company, and it worked with us for a few years. So, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, you got into real estate, got with us, and let's take it from there. Yeah, man. So I ended up moving from, um, in my adult life, I moved to California. My I met my wife on one of those mission trips and when I was doing ministry stuff when I was really young. Um, I actually ended up getting married two days into being 20. So my wife is a little older. She's 23. So I was, I literally just turned 20. Um, so our, my birthday is July 5th. We got married July 7th. And, um, and I didn't know that there was something called the immigration process. We got married in the UK because that's where she was at. And that's where the mission trip was at. And so I ended up meeting her. And then like two months later, God told me that she was my wife. And so like, I didn't like thus saith the Lord, thou shalt marry me, because that'd be creepy. Mm -hmm. But I pretty much I was pretty intentional, like, hey, I, you know, just so you're aware, I want you to hear from God. You need to hear from God before we move forward. But from my end, I've heard from God and I'm ready to marry you. So like I'm ready to to go when you are. Um, and she was like, thanks. She actually, it was weird. Most people might have been like spooked or creeped out, but she actually found it really um um really helpful because she said, okay, now the, it solves the problem. There's no guessing. It's just like, yeah. is this the right fit for me or is it not? Mm -hmm. So that was cool. And, uh, and we ended up getting married two months later. Um, and we found out that there was something called an immigration process. I ended up moving back home with my mom. Well, kind of, she, yeah, kind of sort of in one of my mom's, um, houses that she inherited, I shared it with my sister. Um, so my mom didn't technically live there, but, um, so I was working and, I found out that there's this thing called bills, those pesky things. And like, <laughs> and you have to be responsible and actually like go to work. So I, uh, I started working and doing all these things. Um, and then my wife finally joined me a year and a half later and we had moved from the Bay area to Indianapolis because I had a lifelong friend named Clark Allen who was living in Indianapolis. And we were really prayerful and, and just really felt like God wanted us to move there. Long story short. And my mom decided to sell the house uh, in that me and my sister were living in and split it between the three of us. Um, and so I had a little bit of money coming in um, to pay off debt and to essentially have a down payment for a house. 
wish I knew what I knew now then. My goodness, I tell you, I'd be way more financially successful. But I, I bought a house with 20% down, which is so dumb. So dumb. I could have bought a four unit. Oh my goodness. It's so dumb. Anyway, <laughs> I bought a, a, you know, I, I was there and it was crazy because within a month and a half of me being there, I met Brett and my, I really feel like my career took off. I feel like simple wholesaling was training grounds really for a lot. Like I learned so much about real estate, so much about, cause as a wholesaler that has to know that does their job well, like in, in services buyers, I, I was the head of disposition while I was there. So I, I really had to learn a lot about um, what buy and hold investors look for in a property mm-hmm. and what flip, you know, uh, flippers look for in a property and, and so on and so forth. So there was just a ton that I, that I learned. I mean, I even remember, I was remembering the other day, Brett, um, you were the first person to teach me how to read a purchase agreement. Do you remember that? I went up there. I was like, Brett, I have, I've had my license for two years. I don't know how to read this. And you walked me through this and you like made tutorials for me and like helped me understand section by section. I know you actually, I remember you put together the desk too. And that was, that, that was, was terrible. Fun, we yeah. still joke about that. That's so funny. I, I was like, Jaron is not a contractor. <laughs> Never so, again. <laughs> it so, took him like two uh, days to put together a desk. <laughs> it's so funny that you mentioned that because I, I, we literally just brought it up um, the other day um, that to my pastor, actually, I think it was like the same night, actually, um, that so for those for people listening, there was a desk that Brett wanted me to install. Uh, and I have really strong work ethic, like not in a boastful way, but like I, I one of the things that I can bring to the table is is I can grind. Right. Um, so I think Brett thought that I'd just be able to knock it out real quick and I was going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. It was not. It took <laughs> two full days of me looking up tutorials, like trying to figure it out. I ended up breaking like a big chunk of it mm. and it was a, a nightmare. So yeah. there's a lesson there, guys. Stay in your lane. <laughs> it was, you know, work double down on your strengths, not on your weaknesses. Definitely. Well, I want to just ask you real quick. I mean, we worked together for a few years and you really helped, uh, like I said, put put us on the map and scale. And I, I didn't know a lot either at that time. I was just getting into scaling a business, talking to my coach and just kind of trying to figure it out too. I mean, you were obviously, uh, we were walking side by side in that journey together, but what, what's some things that you learned? Uh, you know, you kind of went from this company of just a couple of people and you saw a company scale and a team and um, you know, we were doing 25, 30 deals a month and it was just a kind of a blur. Honestly, when I think back, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, I can't believe we were doing some of that stuff. But, um, you know, what are, what are some like lessons, I guess, to, to be able to be in, like you were like really in it. We were both really in it. So what are some yeah. lessons that we learned together? I mean, there's two things that come to mind. Um, the first is, I think we had a core value at Simple Wholesaling called enjoy the ride. Um, and I I took for granted what was happening there. I thought that I was going to be at Simple Wholesaling for the rest of my life. And so I, um, I think I got a little spoiled or a little um, presumptuous or assuming um, or entitled that, oh, I'm going to, you know, like, and, and there were some things where I started, I think, complaining a little bit too much or, or getting just bogged down. Cause I grinded. I mean, I was, I, the day that I stopped working at simple wholesaling, my body was so used to stress that the next morning I had slept in because I didn't have to wake up and, and go to a morning huddle. Mm-hmm. And I literally shot up out of bed. Oh my God, I'm late. Ah! Because I, I, I was so accustomed to like follow up and leads and grinding it out. Right. And I mean, six, seven days a week, all at Christmas day, I think every Christmas that I worked at simple wholesaling, I would, I had talked to somebody about selling a property mm-hmm. and my wife and worked with us. So a lot of our night was a lot of our nights were, you know, her on her laptop, me on my laptop in the bed, just talking about leads until 11 o'clock into the wee hours of the morning. How romantic, <laughs> right? And, and so like, I, you know, I, uh, I really was giving it my all, but I think I allowed the stress and the demand to take away from how awesome of an opportunity it was. And I think it, it allowed me to not be grateful um, mm-hmm. or as grateful as I could have been. Um, because it, you know, it, it, 
it was a once in a lifetime opportunity for all of us. And maybe it was just lack of exposure, but looking hindsight and now seeing what else is out there, um, there was some real magic. Like it was just, there was just some crazy, awesome chemistry with the team that we had. And it was a great ride. I mean, we were, we would do stuff where we were like, we're a ministry disguised as a business. And we'd have like worship nights at our office. Oh, yeah, we had like fun. a war room where we'd like start praying. Uh, it's just like, it was so awesome. And the fun. podcast and the exposure and even just the way that we worked well together. Like mm -hmm. we really complimented each other's strengths. Like Tyler is incredible at what he did and he's he's a powerhouse he's a force to be reckoned with and asia and and me and you and um alex and uh and old gary you know all of us just really it just meshed well and that's really unique like that's it was like kind of the perfect storm and um it's really hard to um create like it's it's hard to engineer i think it just had to be, it was to to a degree. I think it was a God thing. I mean, I think you can like analyze people's personality, um, you know, based on like personality tests and stuff, and see if you can match them. But it, there's to, when it was that good. When it gets to that level, mm -hmm. I think it just has to be kind of a God thing. And it was awesome, man. It was an incredible ride. And I wish that I had gone through it with a little bit more. Um, just wow, I can't believe I get to do what I I do. I'm I'm here. I'm making crazy money that people can't even dream of. Um, I'm, you know, have full autonomy over my schedule. You know, I, I have a boss that I actually like to hang out with, you know, mm -hmm. um, it was, it was a, a great ride. Let me, um, let me ask you some questions on this because you yeah. work with a lot of entrepreneurs and investors, and this was something that I always struggled with is enjoying the ride. And I got that actually from my business coach because I asked him, uh, he had built up a great business and after 20 years, uh, he sold the business and I said, Hey, what's one thing that you would have done different? And he said, I would have enjoyed the ride more. Um, do you think that that's just a common theme with, with business owners, entrepreneurs? Yeah, maybe. I think it's just, we're, we're naturally more futuristic in our thinking because mm -hmm. we're always looking for the next leverage point or the next scheme or the next strategy that's going to, you know, give us or get us over the edge or the next problem. A lot of entrepreneurs are really fixated on being problem solvers. And then once they solve the problem, they get bored with it and move on to something else. Um, so I think it's hard to be present in a lot of that stuff. Um, and I, and again, I don't, I don't, I think a lot of the times we are entrepreneurs and successful because we have these personality traits. So I don't want to like throw the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. um, and say, Oh, this is all negative. Wah, wah, wah. Like most things in life I'm starting to realize aren't really as much um, the right way or the wrong way, but it's more pros and cons like mm -hmm. cultures that way. Like you have cultures that, you know, you have something like how strong we are um, in America in terms of individualism like there are some real negatives to that, but there are some amazing positives. I mean, mm -hmm. the reason why the Western world is the most innovative, most life-giving, most productive culture, most uh, in terms of eradicating poverty and all these things, like the Western world did a lot of that because of our overemphasis on individualism and, mm -hmm. and the rights and the inherent rights of the individual. So, um, you know, th those things have major pros that led to a lot of really good things, but I think it's helpful to at least be aware of, of the drawbacks or the, or the negatives so that you can deal with them and compensate for them and stuff like that. But I, I think the reason why we, we struggle with enjoying the ride is because one, we're always stressed out because we're, we're doing the work of like four or five other people. Um, and, and I think that we're, we're always, especially if they're, you're more visionary, like I'm a weird breed where I'm kind of both, I can be visionary and an implementer, but, um, you know, if you're a true visionary, like you're, you're wired to be future oriented. So you're, you're not going to be present, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. Especially in the startup. So if you guys are out there, you're like, well, I, I know what that's like, and I'm, I'm not enjoying my ride. And, uh, obviously if you're futuristic, you can, you can kind of look through and envision and, and, um, you know, if you see light at the end, I mean, that was, that was the thing for me. Like I wanted the freedom and that's why I was trying to put all these pieces into place. And, um, 
and, and here we are. And now I, you know, structure my life around, around that. Um, Jaron, I want to transition into something else real quick. You said that you took things for granted. Um, yeah. and I want to talk about that a little bit, uh, because I think that that's also a common theme in my life and in other people's lives is we take things and it could be anything and, uh, just life in general that we do take for granted. And, um, so you said you took the opportunity for granted and then obviously there was a time and in, in your life during this whole journey that you had lost a child. Mm. Uh, and I know I went through that journey with you, not with you. I was watching you go through that, you and your wife and, um, and saw that happen. And then we can kind of dive into that. That was a very dark time for you. And obviously it kind of does correlate because now you have two children and to take things for granted. So let's talk about that a little bit. Like what, what, how was that for you during that dark place? Cause I'm sure we all live in, in life and we have hard times, right? So there's probably somebody out there going through a dark, dark time right now. So take us into that and, and kind of relate it to taking things for granted. Yeah. So, I mean, I run into a lot of parents specifically that seem to be overly like, um, over the top in their frustration with their kids. Like kids will just be rambunctious and all over the place, yelling in your ear, climbing all over you. Cause that's their nature, their kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I hear a lot of people complain because it's intense and there's no getting around it, man. Kids are super intense. And again, I'm not trying to bring judgment in any of this. That's like not my heart at all. It's just something that uh, I've noticed. So me and my wife, I think it was, my wife is way better at years and dates than I am. I think it was like a solid two years of us trying for another child. So we, we lost our daughter um, at 36 weeks. So um, she was full term. She was ready to my wife was ready to pop and um, something happened where um, Asiya was not really feeling um, any heartbeat or she wasn't feeling any movement. And I was actually out with clients um, showing them houses for simple wholesaling. And, uh, and she called me and said, Hey, I'm concerned da, 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 da. And I told her, don't be concerned. Remember we watched that video where they say that there's less movement in the third trimester. Stop worrying. Da, da, da. But um she was actually spot on. Um, the next day we went into the hospital and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, you know, the, there was no heartbeat. So we had to go through a whole labor process and the whole thing. And we're crazy charismatic Christians. So like our entire church, like rally behind us and believe for a miracle. And we like, we're praying like 24 hours a day for like five days while we were in the hospital, like that, that hospital deserves like a reward, man. They literally let us mourn, (laughs) like not freak out or just let us have our process. And, uh, and it was, it was pretty awesome. I really love the way that we responded from a faith standpoint. Like, um, I think the only thing I would have changed in any of that was not going Facebook public with it, but just keeping it around like local, you know, in person, because having to face people online and over and over again, relive the story of like, no, we lost the daughter, da, 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 da. You know, that was, that was pretty tough. So yeah. if you're ever in a situation like that, uh, it's best not to share that stuff on sh- socials, I think just for, for your guys' sake. But um, all that being said, you know, going back to my original point about, you um, a lot of people complain about their children, like, oh, he's so rambunctious. Oh, she's this, she's that. But there was a time where we didn't know we were going to be able to have kids ever. I mean, we were seeing infertility specialists and we, my wife got uh, surgeries and, you know, all kind of crazy stuff to try and get another child. And we never, we weren't able to. And, um, and, in that, that we would have given literally anything that we had, we would have mortgaged our life. We would have done anything to have a child. And it's easy to get frustrated and, you know, oh, I'm tired or whatever. But like this morning I woke up and I I woke up early. I was, you know, cleaning up the living room, cleaning up toys. And my son walks out of the bedroom uh, with a bottle in his mouth, completely covered from head to toe in poop. 
like <laughs> and he's smiling ear to ear like hey dad and he's reaching up to grab me you know like give me a hug and i'm like oh my gosh you know and there was poop on the walls on the window on his bed <laughs> like as i'm running him to the shower there's poop falling on the ground that's like uh, that's really intense right but i was reminded even this morning in the midst of that I fought for this. Mm -hmm. I fought for this moment to be yeah. able to have a kid that's full of poop that I have to run into the shower and clean up after. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand that. Like, you know, the, even in the context of entrepreneurship, um, they, we signed up for this. We could have all gotten a job mm -hmm. and just like, you know, did the nine to five checkout thing, but we wanted something that was more meaningful, more impactful, more financially rewarding. Mm -hmm. And there's a cost to it, you know, at least on the, on the front end, when you're first, the first few years that you're into it, like you got to grind and you got to, you know, like I, I saw a meme or a quote or something that when something to the effect of, you know, entrepreneurs are the crazy people that are willing to work two or three times as much as anybody else to just work for them, like to do what they want, to just have their to, freedom. Just work for themselves. Yeah. Even if they don't make any more money, a lot of times it's a lot less money, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least you're, freedom. you're doing your thing, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. that's, this is what we fought for. So like when you're in a situation where you have autonomy and you, you know, and again, you got to balance this out because there could be things in your life that you just need to change. Like mm -hmm. you could just be doing too much because you're a control freak and you need to let go of the wheel a little bit and out automate things and set up better systems and all that. But mm -hmm. remember that your business is supposed to be a blessing. Like at the end of the day, it's supposed to make you money and it's supposed to add value to your life. And mm -hmm. if it's not, then there's, there's something wrong that you either need to adjust in the situation and like in the dynamic of your life and business, or, you know, maybe it's a, it's a perspective thing. Like, Hey, you got to deal with leads, but they're your leads that you generated. You know, yeah. it's all you. This is your kingdom, you know? Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I know that it's hard to to relive uh, that portion of your life. And uh, thank you so much for just kind of painting that picture. And Jaren has two kids now. And um, and awesome. How, how old are your kids now? So one, man, you put me on the spot. Uh, I hope my wife doesn't hear this because I'm going <laughs> to butcher it. Uh, I think one of them is five months. I, he's definitely not six months. It's all right. He's like four I'll give you away with months. It's okay. <laughs> four or five months. And then, uh, and then my son is two. My oldest is just turned two in March. Awesome. Sounds good, man. Well, thank you so much again for sharing. And I want to talk to you just kind of about your transition. So after a sip of wholesaling now for the last, what, three, three years, I'd say, uh, yeah. three or four years, you've been working with Ari Tipster, uh, which is a website and the owner of Ari Tipster is Seth Williams. And you were working alongside with Te Seth. You're the co-host of the podcast. You do a lot of videos on YouTube, and um, you know you're always a big part of that. And you you write a lot of blogs about real estate investing. You guys have courses that help train up real estate investors on certain things. So, talk to us about what Ari Tipster is doing right now. Yeah. So um, I'm going to pivot a little bit because there was a transition between simple wholesaling and Ari Tipster where I was into my land business full-time. Yeah. And there's a, a principle I think would be helpful to, to share in that. For sure. And it was actually the the second piece to the the thing that came to mind when you asked me the question of, you know, what lessons did I learn with simple wholesaling? Um, the second lesson was um, just because you're working for a particular business that's at a certain level, doesn't mean that you're going to be able to operate at that same level right out of the gate. And I learned a ton of things by doing things wrong, going from like, I think when I left, we had like a six or eight person team. Um, and I had the same mentality that, uh, that I saw Brett with like, Oh, just send more mail or just, you know, like do more stuff. And, uh, I had no idea how to handle business finances. I had no, idea. I mean, it was like money's in the bank time to do more mail money's not in the bank. It's time to put pressure on agents or figure out how to sell property. And it was not, uh, it was not a very good way to transition. There's, there is a um, kind of a process when you first get started in business where it's like, hey, work within your means and build slowly and get bigger and bigger as you need. Um, and Profit First radically changed my life. It's a book by Mike Michalowicz. Um, I actually know the author for um, Dave Richter, who's writing the Profit First for Real Estate Investors book right now. And I'm really excited for that to be out in the investor community because I wish somebody had handed me Profit First um, 
when I graduated high school, like you have, this is required reading because um, it gives you a understanding of kind of the second side to success because on paper, you can be doing a bunch of deals and look really impressive at your local real estate investor meetup group, but behind closed doors, you could be losing money and like not, not doing well. Right. And uh, that's a very, that's kind of the dirty little secret of a lot of in investor companies. They're like, oh yeah, we did 50 deals last year, but it's like, did you make any money? Right. Like that's the thing. <laughs> and uh, and uh, profit first is a system where you can automate profitability and make sure that you're profitable from day one. Um, and I think it's a much healthier framework to grow and operate businesses out of. So um, that was my second biggest lesson from our, from, um, from simple wholesaling is, if you end up transitioning from a big company uh, or a bigger company into your own thing, um, understand that you are a one man operation and you're just getting started. So yeah. don't, uh, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Like <laughs> you work within your means. No, I love that. I, that's, gr that's a great tip. I love the term, uh, scale your business responsibly. And I always write that down. Even to this day, I mean, when I start something new, I try to think about, okay, how can I do this responsibly? Uh, and, and that's exactly what you're talking about. you right. Scale within your means. Um, and, and that's awesome. So, and then the other thing I, I have a running joke is uh, that if you're at a, uh, an REI club or whatever, and you get up and remember we used to say, Oh, we did 30, de or we do 30 deals a month. And everybody's like, Oh my gosh, that's crazy. You guys are amazing. 30 deals. And like, what if you said after that, like, wait, yeah, we made a dollar a deal. Everybody probably be like, you guys suck. <laughs> like, that's terrible. Yep. You know, it's all, it's all about perspective. So, <laughs> well, and I tell my coaching clients, um, at RA Tipster, we actually teach people how to like start their own land business. Um, and I actually will bring you up a lot and I'll bring Seth up a lot. I teach something called that I've coined the 24 month rule, which, um, most people who are starting a new endeavor, like they'll come to me and they're like, I want to scale. I want to start selling 10 deals a month starting tomorrow, you know? And I tell them, you know, I have a, the most successful people I know, and then I'll, I'll bring up you and I'll bring up Seth, um, spend about a year to two years growing their business on the side while working full-time somewhere else and grinding it out before a, the business grew to a point where they could do it full-time. Mm -hmm. That's not sexy. That doesn't sell from a stage. That's not a motivational Raw, raw story, but those raw, raw stories of overnight successes are outliers that are inspirational and work for the context of getting you hyped up at a conference. But mm -hmm. practically, I see much more of people having a similar experience like you did, where I, I think you worked for another real estate investor or, or something like that, but you were doing real estate for somebody else getting paid its paycheck while doing deals on the side and then built up over time and lived on like, you know, very little of, of your own money and just yeah. reinvested, reinvested, reinvested. And Seth had his own version like that of that at RE Tipster, where he was working at a job that he really didn't like, wasn't fulfilling at all. And every waking hour that he had available, he dedicated it to RE Tipster. And it was 18 months before RE Tipster became something where with, I think it was after 18 months, he started making money. And then it was like, three to six months later, he quit and was like full-time in the RA tipster. Wow. But there are many times during that 18 months, 18 months is a long time where he was like, I don't even think this is worth it. And he's putting hours and hours and hours into this thing and not seeing anything to show for it, mm -hmm. especially in the blogging yeah. space. Cause the ROI is not very yeah. trackable. You do something and then you're like, I wonder if this is going to do well. And you, you have yeah. to wait like six months to a year to even know if you, it was a good, like I made a video about wholesaling and um, I think to date, it's like the my most popular one on RE Tips. I think it's over like 20,000 views or something. Mm -hmm. um, it might be like 15, somewhere around there. But um, that, when I, I mean, it took a year before we got to like 10,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole time, like, I was like, I don't know if it's going to do well or not. Like, and yeah. there's a ton of other videos that I think are just as good, if not better, that have 100 views on it. And this world is very much like, just set it and forget it. And hopefully it yeah. does well. I know. I, I'm, I'm a big, a simple person, obviously, and I'm a big uh, person that just likes to talk about longevity. And I think that's what you're talking about is uh, when people start out in this business and they're like complaining about something, it's not going well. And I'm just always like, hey, keep it simple, number one, and just keep putting one step in front of the other. Just keep moving forward. Keep staying the course. And eventually, I think it'll, it'll work out, whether it's blogging or videos or YouTube channels or buying and selling houses, whatever it is, just 
keep focused. And then I think five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years down the road, you'll probably start being we'll successful. Be <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do there. think if you've dedicated two years to something and you don't have traction like that, there's opportunity at that mm-hmm. point for you to be like, okay, what's not working? Should I abandon yeah. this? Is this just not for me? Cause there are people out there. Um, like I've met people at real estate investor groups who like, yeah, I've been, I've been studying real estate for 10 years and they haven't even done a deal yet. And, and mm-hmm. I think that there is a certain point where it's like, okay, something like me being a contractor would not work out. I'm just like, if I tried my best to be a contractor, <laughs> it would not happen. So there might be some of that that you have to consider, but I do think that people need to commit. And I tell all of my coaching clients, I'm like, yo, we're going to do this land business, commit to it for two years because mm-hmm. you're going to make a bunch of mistakes and your things are going to be all crazy. And a lot of people aren't even profitable their first year. Like mm-hmm. with profit first, I think you can be if you structure it properly, but a lot of people aren't profitable their first year, they're profitable their second or third year. So like stick to the process for at least give it a good go for two years and then take it from there. Most likely more, uh, more likely than not, you're going to be successful. Mm, I love it. So I know you guys have been working on some things, Ari Tipster. A lot of times uh, you're working on courses about maybe how to get your first deal. You're writing things about that. A lot of things about land. You've been in the land business for a long time, which is a great business. I I love land. We've bought and sold some land together. And and also and this is something that obviously is, is in your heart, house hacking. You guys yep. are working on something like uh, a course on house hacking. So And you house hack, right? Yeah. So yeah. I... Um, the last property I got was a duplex that I bought on land contract. I ended up not moving forward and, and keeping that property just because he wanted too much and the assessed value wasn't as much as he wanted for, for the property. So, um, I ended up getting a triplex, which is where I'm in right now. And it's awesome, man. I, it was kind of a God thing. It's a lot, you know, a lot of story, a lot of details, but, um, this is pretty much my dream house for me and my wife, this is the best house we've ever lived in. She has her dream kitchen and um, a lot more space. Uh, I'm in my, I have my, my own office. That's like super bougie and amazing. And like this entire room was just basement before we came here. And wow. I, you know, it's, it's just really incredible. And I got it for $2,618 and like 98 cents out of pocket. Like that's, wow. I mean, it was, it was crazy. So like when you understand creative financing, you understand the power of like FHA loans and like all the the stuff that's available in real estate Mm -hmm. right now. I'm paying. That's what I love. That's what I love about you is you talk really practical, right? Uh, You're not the, the bougie guy with the flashy exotic Lamborghini or whatever in the background. Uh, you're, You're very practical house hacking very practical. And you can do that with so many different things in your life, right? You talk about profit Mm -hmm. first, following a system, budgeting. I know you guys have done that, uh, Dave Ramsey things and stuff like that. So talk to the people out there, like, you know, how important is it to really just get rid of all the fluff and just stay practical and yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is the 80, 20 principle is a core value of mine. I actually have a vision board, like I ripped it off from the EOS model and applied it to my life. And mm-hmm. um, I do actually have core values that I've really thought through. And the 80, 20 principle is very much um, a very close to my chest because um, people think it's like a cute little thing like, Oh, okay. You know um, 80% of my output comes from 20% of my input, but it, it's a lot more than that. Like, the 80 20 principle is built into the fabric of the way the world works. Um, so life is not fair. It's 80 20. Mm-hmm. And if you understand that, that no matter, like, even in, if we talk about a, a, the concept of like communism, right. Where the, the goal of the philosophy or the, the, the economic structure is to have equality among everyone. Well, what you end up having is you have a 1% and a 99%. The government owns everything. So there's no way that you can get out of this, the the reality that there are leverage points that are going to give you way more results than um, than other efforts. So like me and Seth actually had a, a pretty cool discussion last year on our podcast about um, the 10X rule versus the 80-20 principle, because mm. 10X can be massively wasteful. Like if you think about, like if I wanted to, to work out, right. Like, um, 
you know, what's healthy is let's say work out one hour a day. Well, if you 10 X that you're going to work out 10 hours a day, like, really? Yeah. No, that's stupid. <laughs> that, <laughs> is, do that. That, is, I, that would be terrible. That would be would absolutely die. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't, you don't want to 10, I think 10 X you need to take with a grain of salt because you could actually do uh, one little thing and you could have bought Bitcoin in 2015 mm. and that would have been your leverage point and you would have been a millionaire right now. Mm -hmm. You would have been totally fine, right? Like, and you didn't do anything except just buy Bitcoin and That's roll it. the dice. Yeah. So like there, there are things out there that if you can have the, the freedom to, to think clearly and really assess your business and assess the opportunities in your industry, um, there are leverage points that you can discover that will massively yield you results. And so I think why, based on that principle being so influential in my life and my personal framework, I look for things that actually lead to results in every area of my life, spirituality, marriage. I, I, I want success and I want to thrive in every area of my life. And that looks like something and that actually is tangible. So based on that, I, I don't want to deal with things that are just going to waste my time. I want to find those leverage points that are actually going to get me the, the results that um, everybody wants. Mm -hmm. you know? You're know, you you're a guy that you like to step back and just kind of see the big picture and get some clarity. So like, I think a lot of people don't do that, especially us men. We're like, we're grinding it out. We're in the fog. We're just going to keep pounding it, waking up early, staying up late, bidding the, uh, burning the midnight oil. And we don't get a lot of clarity when we do that. My biggest times of clarity is when I step back, I evaluate like what what is even going on? Like, what do I even want? Right. And what, what's my family doing and what's, what season of life am I in? Right. Um, how do you, th how important is that to just to take a step back as entrepreneurs to, to kind of get that? I think it's really important. Um, but I also think that that can be a part of the, the daily or the, the rhythm of your life. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, there's this guy named Perry Marshall who wrote, um, he's an 80, 20 guy, among other things he wrote, like, uh, his books actually like right there, um, 80, 20, uh, how do you say it's 80, 20 sales and marketing is what it's called. And, um, I randomly met him at church and that's how I like, like found out about him. And, um, and I've talked a lot, um, and kind of spent some time with him on some other projects and so on and so forth. And one of the things that he does in his work schedule is really strategic. Every Monday he he reserves it for a thinking day and he doesn't take any calls. He doesn't take, like, he doesn't have any meetings. He, um, he reserves Monday for thinking cause he's fresh from the weekend. He's re rejuvenated. He has the most amount of energy, the most amount of clarity going in on Monday. So he takes Monday and essentially is a recluse and just like sits by himself and thinks. Hmm. And, uh, and then the rest, you know, the, the remaining five to six days, he grinds it out and does other things. Right. Um, he does, he kind of works his way from his week of doing like high, heavy mental energy stuff in the beginning of the week. And then he'll go towards in the end of the week, things that, um, are more easy, like for him having a podcast or talking to somebody is more chilling. So he does a lot of that stuff, like on Friday, mm -hmm. um, he it's extremely wasteful. Like there are, it's unfortunate, but in order for you to find key leverage points, you, you have to waste your time on a bunch of ideas that aren't going to pan out or not going to turn into anything, mm -hmm. but it's still the best use of time in the long run, because, um, though you have a lot of urgent things that are always going to be pressing on you, it's the important things that will move the needle. For example, in my land business, right. Uh, before I, uh, I started my land business everybody in land was saying that agents, using real estate agents to sell your property was a dumb idea. Real estate agents don't know anything about land. They just do, you know, buying and selling houses, blah, blah, blah. And I can't take the credit. It's totally my wife. My wife was the one that discovered this, but it ended up, it's now kind of becoming a, a standard in the land industry, which is kind of crazy that like, I don't know, maybe in a, maybe I'm being a little boastful, but it, we were kind of trendsetters. Um, and Seth will tell you like, cause I wrote a blog post about how I use land specialized real estate agents. And after that, people now talk about it as it's like the greatest thing ever. Um, but before that, everybody, and he'll, he'll attest to that. Everybody was like, no way. Um, you don't ever use agents, but the biggest bottleneck in the land business is selling property. So like, it's kind of, uh, 
the reverse of, of of wholesaling houses like it's hard to get a deal as a wholesaler it's easy to sell a deal because you can just find investors um and then build relationships with repeat buyers um it's kind of the opposite in land it's easy to get a deal it's harder to sell a deal and it takes there's a longer sales cycle and all that um and so the majority of land investors spend the bulk of their week posting things on craigslist dealing with buyer leads that are like is this still available on facebook marketplace and all that stuff um, I don't have time to deal with all that because I work very full-time at our tipster. So I, through working with land specialized real estate agents and learning how to vet agents to make sure that they actually specialize in land, I, uh, I outsource the biggest bottleneck of my business. And so now I I'm doing a lot and we're actually scaling. We're go- going into different States and like, um, we're doing about 10,000 units of mail a month in Florida right now and all kind of crazy stuff. But I am still spending on a very busy week, maybe 10 hours to 15 hours a week on my land business. Mm -hmm. And it's icing on the cake. And there's, you know, there's my, I'm not taking my month to month salary from it, but so I I have the freedom to be able to like wait until just build a pipeline and wait until things cash out. Um, But all that being said, like that's a leverage point. And my wife had the freedom to, to think through and like, how can we get these properties sold? And, and we stumbled across this thing, which is a huge deal. So um, it might feel wasteful or you might, you know, have to at first deal with the fact of like, you know, in your head, Oh, I got to get back to this person. I got to do this. I got to get back to this email, da, 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 da. but all that urgent stuff is always going to be there. And there's always going to be something demanding for your attention. It's the important stuff that um, really is going to move the, the needle in the long run. So even if it, you spend eight hours, a full work day, and you only have one idea, that one idea could be your million dollar idea. Mm. No, so. I love it. I love it. It's so important. So important. Uh, just to step back, get some clarity. And I'm also a guy that you got to have measure, you measure these things. I mean, right. You are using real estate agents in your land business because, you know, you could not do that and you could stay up all the time and work more hours and, and try to do the Craigslist and answering the calls. But, um, but you know, sometimes you got to give up a little bit. And that, that's just all me. I mean, you know me for a long time. I'm easily able to give up some more money if I can get my time back. Right. Yep. So I think we got to get through that. So Jaren, I got just a couple more questions before we go to the last section of the show. Um, I want to talk about, you've had a lot of transitions and change just in your life uh, from even the things that we've talked about. You've moved, you've changed jobs here and there, you've done different business ideas here and there. And um, a lot of times transition and change is really hard for people. And uh, they, you know, you probably work with people that it's just hard to even fathom not working at a nine to five job because it's just different, right? Um, Do you have any feedback on that person that they can kind of, you know, get through that, overcome that, that fear of change? Well, if it depends on the person, like if they want to change, then I have uh, advice for them. But something I'm starting to realize is that some people are just wired different. Like us entrepreneurs are, God has given us a very particular set of skills, um, like taken (laughs) and, uh, and, you know, we can, um, when we double down on our strengths, we give to the world what God intends for us to give as leaders and entrepreneurs. Um, And there are are leaders that work nine to five jobs and there are other people who are called to other things. Like if you want to be super involved in like a ministry, having a dead end nine to five job that's not very fulfilling, that can sustain you while you do the thing that you're actually called to do, then cool, that's awesome. You know, like it, there's, I, I think that there's a lot of shame around like people who work nine to five jobs or whatever. And I'm, I'm a little bit different because I'm kind of like that Dave Ramsey entree leader thing where like, I'm very much wired as an entrepreneur, but um, you know, I'm so technically like a W2 employee, like I'm working at our tipster. And um, I think that when you're a higher up executive, like it's more entrepreneurial, like when you're a manager or whatever, um, you know, things do end up kind of changing from being like a cog in the wheel. Right. Um, but for those people, like my, my brother-in-law is a good example, like as who he is right now, um, he's much better off working with me in my land business and kind of being my VA. He lives in Kazakhstan and he does a lot of the stuff that I don't really want to do and don't have time to do. And it's, it works great for him because he's making great money. He works from home. He he's doing well. So all that being said, don't want to shame the, uh, the employees out there, but for somebody who feels like, 
they're not satisfied or fulfilled or that they're called to other things, but they're, they're afraid of, of um, taking the, the leap. Um, there's a saying out there that this like really inspirational raw, raw story of like burning the boats where I think the, the Spanish people from way back in the day, they went to like Mexico and then the leader like burned the boats because it's like, Oh, now we have no option to go back. Ra ha ha ha. You know? And, and that's all fine and dandy, but I, I don't think that's practical at all. Um, I think that I used to, you know, sound the drum to that whole philosophy as well. And in life, it goes back to what I was saying about, the 24 month rule, like it, it, fear is a good thing. Like God gave us fear so we won't get hurt. <laughs> like, I mean, and there's a rational fear and there there's ditches on both sides of things, right? So extremes are bad, but um, if you're a, f- a family person and you people depend on you for your livelihood, you, you probably are wise to be a little bit afraid because mm-hmm. there's a lot of uncertainty, yeah. but you can work towards something that you really care about in a healthy uh, way at a healthy pace that will be a very natural, smooth transition for everybody involved. You don't have to do the crazy, quit your job and, and, you know, like the next day you're out hustling, you know, and you know, your back's against the wall. To be honest, my personality, if I have financial difficulty in my life, um, my, I, my brain shuts off. I'm Mm -hmm. stupid. Like I, I make so many decisions that are like irrational or fear-based or, or just not the right move. Um, I'm much better I think clear and I make better decisions when um, financially I, I I know something's coming in, good, bad, or ugly. And I don't know if that's good. I don't know if that's a lack of trust in God or or whatever, but it's just the reality. So if you're in a situation where you want to transition into a full-time business or, or some other pursuit, like start it now mm-hmm. and sacrifice and it's going to suck. You're going to have to probably, you know, be tired and stay up late at night and and uh, do what needs to be done in order for you to build the thing. But every, what you can get a lot done in two hours a night. Like Mm -hmm. if you got two, three hours a night, there is a lot that you can get done and start building slowly and start, you know, praying through it and and declaring that this is going to be your future and moving towards that. And then probably within two years, you'll probably be at a spot where you've replaced your daily income or your, your W2 income, or at least got it enough income from your side business where you can live off of it and maybe cut, you know, pinch pennies a little bit, but then make the transition to, to make more a lot faster. Right. So I think that there's way more wisdom in having savings and having things in place and, you know, making the transition in the most practical, smooth way that you can. Again, going back to being practical, I just like, I think that there is a lot of wisdom that I didn't live out in my youthful twenties. But if I were to give myself advice, I'd be like, dude, like if you have six months to a year worth of savings or even like a year and a half worth of savings, dude, you can just live off your nest egg for six months while you're figuring out your business. Mm -hmm. Like that's super practical. You don't have to worry about it. The stress is gone. Like you got six months to grind it out. Yeah. So exactly. That's what I would suggest. Practical tips, guys. Realistic, practical tips. Take this uh, with you uh, with Jared Barnes. And Jaron, uh, thank you so much. We're kind of running short on time. I'm going to go in the next section of the show. But um, uh, before we do that, where can someone find the best place to find you? Yeah, probably the RE Tipster Forum. We just came out with a public forum. Cool. Um, similar to Bigger Pockets, you just have to join it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's all free. And then um, you can jump on there and at mention me and say, hey, I heard you from the the uh, Brett Snodgrass podcast. I meant to say, I almost said simple whole thing. <laughs> it's all good. Go check that out. Ari tips for guys. I will also say back to just really quickly on the house hacking stuff. I was going on and on about how amazing house hacking is. And I forgot to mention that we're coming out with a house hacking course that I, uh, I took lead on. So I think like 80, 90, 95% of it is just me. Um, and we'll have like a lot of really awesome resources. And the objective is to get you from like not being a house hacker to getting your, your property. Like, Mm -hmm. so we take you every single step of the way of, you know, working with wholesalers or agents or what have you financing all that stuff, due diligence to actually getting, um, a property that you can house hack yourself. So it's called house hacker university, and it should be published uh, out in the public, um, the end of May. Awesome. Sounds good. So check that out, guys. House Hacker University. 
All right, Jaron. Uh, so I always like to do a section of the show at the end. It's just kind of fun. And uh, today I have for you, uh, what's it like to live in a barn? This is a house. So Jaron, is, their last name is Barn. So I, there's that saying that says, hey, did you grow up in a barn? So this is called, what's it like to grow up in a barn? This is a house. <laughs> house um so these answers should be under 60 seconds okay okay all right so number one what is going on in the barn's house at 11 p.m i'm working okay <laughs> sounds good what is your favorite place to go within 30 minutes of the barn's house my office Working still? Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. What is your perfect life in 60 seconds? Go. Um, being a globe trotter. I want me and my family to travel a lot. Like my, one of my dreams and things I'm working towards is um, being in a position where three to six months out of the year, we can be traveling. Mm. I like that. Globe trotter. Is that... Is that a, like, has nothing to do with ba baseball no, or basketball, basketball, whatever it is. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm right, a sports what, guy. You can tell. <laughs> What's your favorite song to sing in your car? Go. Oh man, that's really hard. Um, Beauty's only skin deep by the temptations. It's a really funny song because today it wouldn't fly with all the, the political like uh, correctness. But it's a song that's pretty much, you're fat and ugly, but it's okay. I love you anyway. It's a great, it's the con the content is really funny, but the song itself is really fun to sing. So I, I jam out. Awesome. Love it. Uh, if you pass go, what do you collect? Go. What's pass go? What's that mean? I don't know. If I pass go, yeah. what? Yeah. If you pass go, what do you collect? I don't know what that means. Okay. I don't know how to answer it. So what is what is your go to pass? <laughs> I'm so confused, bro. I don't know how to answer that question. All right, never mind. We're just going to skip that one. Pass. Uh, all right. If you buy a sandwich, do you pay cash or credit? I use a debit card. Because I don't, I'm, I, I've am i finally come to terms with my framework on, on uh, debt, and I only want to use debt if it, uh, buys me something that has a, generates enough revenue to cover the cost of the debt and makes me money on top of it. So in my personal world, I'm not using any credit cards, but I'm, right. I'm too, uh, too modernized to use yeah, cash. That's I good. just use cards, debit nice. cards. Nice. The pure entrepreneur right there. Um, all right. Do you have a regret? You know, I was, I read through these questions, um, before, I jumped on the interview to try to be a little bit prepared. And that question really stumped me because I, if you would have asked me that like in the past, like maybe three months ago or a year ago, two years, I probably would have said yes, but I just did this huge overhaul of like, all right, I'm going to get really clear on who I want to be and what I want out of life. And now I have a system that is in place that is keeping me accountable towards working to what I really want out of life and being very clear on what I want out of life. And so at the moment, I don't really feel like I have any regrets because the things that I would regret, I'm actually trying, I'm going after and I'm, I'm in pursuit of. So um, I really try to think through it. I mean, I mean, I could say like, I didn't, tell my wife, don't worry about it with our daughter. And we went to the daughter or, or went to the hospital and, you know, maybe saved our daughter's life. Like there's things that I could do there, but I, I don't really hold that as like, mm -hmm. there's no um, value in shaming yourself, right. Mm -hmm. Of like past mistakes. And I think mistakes are an opportunity to, to learn. It's just mm -hmm. feedback. If you remove the emotion from it, all of it is like, Hey, this hypothesis in this experiment did not work. Mm -hmm. So do something else. I like that. I'm going to use that biggest love outside the Barnes house. Um, I mean, probably God, but then I also really, I really love, um, theology, but I, and I also really love making videos. I think, uh, I really wish I got into making videos when I was younger. Cause man, like, uh, there's nothing more that I'd rather do than like edit videos all day. Like I just absolutely love 
the story element and being able to the creative side of it. Like I love making videos. So I hope to get better and better at that. Love it. All right. Last one. What are your thoughts on the insane clown posse? Um, so the insane clown posse, that's a really hard question to answer in 60 seconds, but, um, (laughs) I, I think out of all the questions, that's the hardest one. Yeah. That one's pretty tough. Um, cause it's a mixed bag, right? Like, um, the insane clown posse was a a pretty big seed in me becoming a Christian because Mm -hmm. they have, uh, these seven albums that they call the six Joker cards. And each one has like a message behind it or whatever. And the seventh Joker card is two albums are the six Joker. The sixth Joker card is two al- albums. One of them is called Shangri-La and one of them is called Hell's Pit. And at the very end of Shangri-La, which is representative of heaven, he's like the, the main guy, one of the main artists says, the truth is we follow God and we want all juggalos to find him. Now their version of God, I mean, they, Mm-hmm. do drugs and like party and have a lot of crazy wild sex and all that kind of stuff. Um, but at their core message is they're like, Hey, you should actually pursue God because God brings you back to your innocence and where you can find peace with yourself mm-hmm. and all that. Right. Wow. So, so that one of the only reasons why I was open to God or remotely, I had like a crack on the door that was open <laughs> on God things was because these guys that I really looked up to told me I want all juggalos to find God. Wow. So, you know, it's hard for me to, to like throw the baby out with the bathwater again. Right. There's it's pros and cons. Um, their music is very dark and demented and there's a lot of psychological negatives to um, systematically exposing you. I mean, like one of in hell's pit, one of the songs that I still remember to this day is I cut the head off a mule. I gutted it. I put it on and then I wore it to school, you know, like, and then like there's songs like suicide hotline about killing yourself and like, it's oh. really dark, yeah. dark stuff. I probably wouldn't let my children listen to the insane clown yeah. posse unless they were over the age of 18. Right. <laughs> so like there, there's, um, uh, a lot to be said there, but, um, I think that at the end of the day, they are two guys that are doing what, um, they're, they are called to do. And maybe it, it's a little bit more on a spectrum on the fallen state of humanity, but there's still a redemptive quality to it because they're giving people hope and they're giving people a sense of community and, and connection. So it's like, again, it's a mixed bag. Awesome, man. I wouldn't expect that answer, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, this is a wrap, guys, with the one and only Jaron Barnes. Thanks so much for being on the show today, man. Appreciate yeah, man. you. It's fun. And uh, let's hang out. Let's do it. Let's get an apartment together one day. Let's do it. I'm uh, down. Our families. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Take it easy. Thank you so much for checking out the Brett Snodgrass channel. If you like this video, please slam on that like button. And if you really like it, then subscribe to our channel here. And remember to leave us a comment below, and I'm going to try my hardest to reply to all the comments. Thank you guys so much. This is why I do what I do. Every single week, I come out with content that focuses on success, freedom, and living out your purpose. Thank you guys so much. See you next time.